Good morning. You may have your seats. Um, so I know some of you are here for Dr. Wallace. So he had something online. So he said, I think they picked him up at 10.45. So we're expecting to be here by 11.30. So when he comes, we'll just start. It's a prophetic Sunday. Usually our fourth Sunday is when we do prophecy because we're, we're restoring the gifts to the church. So when Jesus Christ, the last thing somebody does when they pass on is very, very important. And so Jesus Christ, when he ascended, when he was now going, he gave gifts to men. So he gave apostles, men and women. So apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So this is very, very important. So that's why we have a prophetic Sunday because we're trying to restore um, the place of prophecy in the church because we cannot take some things from the word of God and remove others. So he's coming. I... It's a prophetic Sunday and he does, he has the gift of prophecy, but he's also an apostle. Um, I remember he's the one who brought in an element of faith and even the ministry and the grace that I operate under because he came in with Apostle Nemo Rakino and then Apostle Nemo Rakino is where I sat under for Bible study. And then later, I remember just praying to God and saying, um, I just want to meet Dr. Wale. And he walked into a meeting where I was uh, ministering um, in the Upper Hill Leaders Fellowship. And so since then, we have um, grown in relationship. But sometimes it's good to understand what we're going into. Could the last row, which has Kulola, uh, Gem, everybody just come forward. You feel like you're so far. There's so much space in the front. Kulola, come and sit here near Harry. There's a space right there next to him, uh, to the lady there. Just move forward. Because sometimes I feel like you're, we're far and um, I don't know what we're running away from. We're not running away from anything. We are supposed to be together in the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. So it's good to lay a foundation. So I thought first, at least we've done worship. So the worship was good, I think, yeah, you would agree? Yes, because yeah, it was really good. Shitako, I don't know what she ate over, the, I don't know. Was it yesterday? I don't understand. Did she? She drank Uji something or music. Maybe she drank music or something because I'm like, wow, she's really flowing. Um, so uh, for the next like 20 minutes, as we wait for... Um, Apostle Prophet Dr. Wale, you see, you receive somebody in the way that you understand them. Eh? I hope you know that. You're, you're not convincing. Yeah. If you, if you, you know, the people call me Angie, then people just cringe. And it's okay. My name is Angie, isn't it? But if you receive me as Angie, then what you receive is Angie. There's, there's nothing I can give to you. It's not that I'm withholding, but if you have a revelation of who I am, I don't like that, that title, Bishop. I really don't like it. But um, it's not really about like it's you, I guess she has a revelation why they want to call me Bishop and uh, as an overseer. But I remember also when I was ordained, because I've been ordained twice. When I was ordained the first time as a pastor, the Archbishop Kibarabara put the, the ram's horn 
across my shoulders and that's only done for bishops. And he said he didn't know why he did it. But you see, God knows. God knows what's coming ahead. He actually even ordained me. I didn't have a ministry or a church affiliation, but he met me several times and he told his, um, his uh, PA to find me. He said, we have to ordain that woman because she's very anointed. So that's how I got ordained by Archbishop Derek Barabara. And at the ordination, he ordained me as a bishop, which is really strange. Even if he was saying, I don't know why I'm doing this, but that's not it. So I want us to spend a few time, a few minutes praying because it's expectation. You see, it's expectation. I don't even, this recently, I saw this message from Bishop Noel Jones um, talking about revelation, that, that things are caught by revelation and by recognizing an anointing. You can come in this place and receive nothing. And it's not our fault because you haven't come with revelation. You haven't come with expectation. We always sort of like also make fun. Like one day, if ever Bishop T.D. Jakes comes here or something like that, we're taking everything. We're not even leaving anything. And I like the way the Nigerian church behaves. I remember there's a place he went, he ministered, and he, then he got off the stage in an hour. And I love that because Kenyans would just have been polite. Then Nigerians told him, excuse me, sir. Hey, back on that. You, eh? you can try to minister here for one hour. Get back on that stage and release everything that you came with. And you're not getting off that till we feel you are done. You couldn't believe it. Back on the stage for two hours because you have to make a demand on the anointing as well. I'm teaching you. You have to make a demand. You have to say, God, this is what I want. This is what I need. You cannot be in the place of saying, this is just another day or I've gone to so many prophetic services or I don't even believe in that. And the best thing about God is that the faith is the size of a mustard seed. I mean, a mustard seed is tiny. That's all he needs. He needs your faith. He needs you to raise your expectation. He needs you to say, it doesn't matter what has been coming at me. Today, I must receive something from the Lord. And it helps because it unlocks a lot of, sometimes I feel like years of, of things that you'd have waited for a long time. I've been saying, I've been sharing a lot of my stories, too many. I'm like, hey, these stories are too many. But I remember once being in a service at his house, Dr. Wallace's house. And I am, as he ministered to me, a lady said she saw something dead leave me. That's amazing. Like a whole deadness left, another dead person completely. I didn't even feel it, but this person observed it. So be expectant. The man has a gift. The man has a grace. He, he came into this nation to carry. He carried the grace and an anointing. So we can't just receive him as business as usual. So I want you to pray. I want us to stand up and just make some prayers. One, the first person I want you to pray for is yourself. And I want you to pray for yourself that, that God will raise your expectation. Number two, that your hearts will be open to receive what the, what the, what the, the apostle of God has, has ministered for you because you need it first, amen? So open up your mouth and pray for yourself in your understanding, in your spirit, pray for yourself first. You yourself first pray. Heavenly Father, we pray for the grace of God. I want to pray for myself. I want to decree and declare, Father Lord, that everything that you have deposited in Apostle, Prophet, Dr. Wale, Akiemi for me is going to come to me. I will not miss out on my time of visitation. I open up my heart. I open up my life to receive from you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I decree, declare that you are God, that you are worthy, that you are awesome, that you are mighty, and that there is none like you. Then I'm not going to miss out on this. This is not going to be business as usual. It doesn't matter what I have done. It doesn't matter what the enemy is trying to accuse me of in this moment. I am open to receive from you. I am expectant to receive from you. I understand there is a grace and an anointing on this man in the name of Jesus, and I'm here to receive it. He's carrying my gifts. He's carrying my deposit. He's carrying things that are going to shift things in the name of Jesus. He's carrying a grace that's going to remove obstacles out of my life, because in Isaiah 62, it says, remove the stones, remove everything that's blocking up the highways and create access even through intercession in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Father, Lord, I pray that at this moment, keep praying for yourself. Me, I pray for myself that we are expectant, that our hearts are open. My heart is open to receive from you. My mind is open, Lord. I move with revelation. I want to catch this grace. I want to catch the anointing. I want to catch the revelation in the name of Jesus Christ. I want to move from one place to another. I want miracles, signs, and 
and wonders to take place in my life. I want to be that person in Luke 252. The Bible says that Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature, and he found favor with God and favor with man. Help me find favor with you. Help me find favor with my fellow peers and colleagues in the name of Jesus. Lord, raise the expectation of the heart. I need a word from the Lord. The Bible says that God cannot move until the prophet speaks and until the prophet releases, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Therefore, we have expectation and raise our expectation that we are receiving from the vessel of God, from the grace of God, the gift of God. You have deposited in him the ability to move mountains in my life, to shift things out of the way, to open doors in the name of Jesus, to ensure that gates do not shut, to bring in the wealth of nations, Lord, into everything and every aspect of my life in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Father, we love you and we bless you. Father, we give you praise and give you glory. You are worthy. You are awesome. You are great. We are expectant in your presence in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And all, everybody said, amen. Amen. The next place I want us to pray about is your, your wealth creation. So whenever I pray for wealth creation, I pray for models, avenues, abilities. There's one more. I can't remember wealth creation, morals, avenues, and abilities. You can pray for those ones. So wealth creation, the ability to create wealth. Because the Bible says that he has given us the ability to create wealth, to confirm a covenant. So if there's no wealth, something is missing. I'm, are you here? And, and sometimes the enemy, who did I hear talk about that the other day? This prophet Adam. We, we, we act like we're powerless. We've got to stop that business. Because that's what the enemy does. God has said, wealth is a confirmation of a covenant. You have the covenant the day you got born again. You entered the, are we together? You entered there? So anything else that is trying to tell you, you don't have a covenant, you have to shut it down. You have to shut down that voice. You have to be like a crazy person. You have to claim that covenant. You have to decree and declare it in the name of Jesus. Dr. Wale is a good person. I know I'm trying to raise your expectation. I know some of you came because of Dr. Wale. So I don't know why the Holy Spirit wants to raise expectation. But when Dr. Wale came into this nation, he landed at the airport without a single shilling. Yes, we know that. Yes. And what did he start walking up and down saying? What did he say? You don't know. I've shared that story with you too many times. What did, he, what did he say? At his own cost. So even if that's what you want to do today. He stood outside the airport and just walked up and down saying, no man goes to war. You can even change it for yourself today. You have said that I have a covenant. Okay. They might think I'm reading my own Bible. Deuteronomy, is it 80, 8, 18? Please, whatever you need to say today, you need to say. Because lack should not be your portion. It shouldn't be. There's another thing, which I think when Apostle George is here, you also need to pray. Because wealth can come, but then you're not practicing the principles. Yeah, God is not playing games with you. When he gives you wealth, then you have to do the principles. I remember the days when I used to have 100 shillings. I would write my 10 shillings. I'm not playing games with that 10 shillings. Because it's a principle. Because I even heard somebody else say the other day. Just to confirm things that we know. The kingdom of God operates on principle. Not magic. Not which, okay, you're not going to talk to me now. The kingdom of God operates on. And the worst or best thing about those principles is whoever applies them gets the reward. There are people like here like Warren Buffett. He gave away half his wealth. It came more. That guy who wrote rich dad, poor dad. These are not Christians. These are not, but wealth. You know, the other day I was remembering when um, Dr. Chosky came for us. Was it Chos what Dr. Chosky? The Hindu lady, she said, money is like blood. It has to flow. I was like, hey, Hindu with a dot here. I said, where? So you better get your own truth because you have Jesus. She said, money is like blood. It has to flow. Where was I? <clears throat> I was somewhere. But I'm trying to say that you can't believe that. So I was saying about principles. You see, the other thing is where we get stuck, then we start blaming God. God is blamed for many things. So now you get stuck because he's giving you the wealth, but you're not applying that. So how are we supposed to help you? We can dip you in anointing oil. You stay there for 10 days, soaking. We can't do anything for you. Because it's not magic. It's about applying principles. So I want you to pray for yourself for principles. 
I want to pray that, that you to pray for yourself because it's about wealth creation. Whether you're employed in the marketplace, whether you're doing a business, whether you want to get into business, whether you want multiple streams of income, whatever it is you want, you must, must, must. <laughs> no! Yeah, no, okay. Where do I sit? Hello. <laughs> Can I finish the last prayer? Then you will take over. I finish. Amen. Thank you for coming. So you're going to pray for yourself in terms of wealth creation. You've gone quiet now because Dr. Ali has come. You are going to pray for yourself in terms of wealth creation, models, avenues, abilities, and that God has given you a covenant to confirm that wealth and that you practice the kingdom principles. Amen. Let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we bless you. We love you. We give you praise, Father. We pray for ourselves in terms of wealth creation, that there are models, avenues, abilities in the name of Jesus Christ, that Father, you will give us the ability to create wealth, to confirm the covenant that we have with you in the name of Jesus. Any kind of lack must, must, must to come out of the way. We must also be able to see clearly the vision of what we need to do in the name of Jesus. Give us ideas. Give us abilities, Father. Confirm that word. The word of God says that when we enter into covenant, with you that father there is wealth that is apportioned to that covenant father lord teach us your principles in the name of jesus christ give us the ability to produce wealth give us the ability to be set apart for your grace for your glory for your life in the name of jesus christ father we worship and bless and love you we give you praise and give you glory father we shall not have lack we shall not be a laughing stock in the name of jesus we are tired of the church being called poor in the name of jesus we are tired of being ridiculed in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we must have wealth, Father. I'm almost feeling like Hannah who said, bless me or make me die. In the name of Jesus, bless us, Lord. Let there be breakthroughs, financial breakthroughs in the name of Jesus. Give us understanding of financial principles in the name of Jesus. What must we do in the name of Jesus? What must we do, Lord, so that there is a breakthrough, Father, so that we also create generational wealth in the name of Jesus that the wealth does not run out with us, but we create wealth for generations to enjoy in the name of Jesus. Other people have taken these principles, Father. They are working for them, Lord, and we're still stuck there, thinking that tithe is for the man of God or the woman of God. God takes care of his servants. Lord, we do not need that. You don't even need money in the name of Jesus. The word of God says that the streets of heaven are paved with gold. Father, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, give us the ability to create wealth. Wealth. Show us how to create wealth. Download models, avenues, abilities to create wealth. Give us capacity. Let us meet the right people. Let us be risk averse in the name of Jesus. Let us get over fear in the name of Jesus. Let it be okay if we make mistakes, but we try in the name of Jesus. Unlock the gift of wealth. Unlock the grace of wealth in the name of Jesus Christ. Say amen. Heavenly Father, we just want to bless you for Dr. Wale Akiemi. We bless you for the grace and the gift of God that he is. We thank you for the anointing that he carries. And we thank you that we have prepared ourselves, ready to receive from him, Father. And we know that you have prepared him, Father. We honor him greatly. We love him greatly. And we say, Father, bless him for us. Because as you bless him, we are blessed. Let him minister to us. There are people in this room who are saying, please, Lord, minister to me. Minister to me today. It's a prophetic Sunday, Lord. Prophecy works, Lord, and it's almost impossible to do anything without it. So we need a word from the Lord. We need revelation. We need to catch it in the realm of the spirit. So we honor you. We bless you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I don't think I need to Amen. No. Uh -huh. uh, you know, let me tell you what the Apostle George did yesterday. Please sit down. Let me tell you what the Apostle George did yesterday. He was giving me so much water to drink. I had to be taking uh, intervals. <laughs> if you know, you know, you know. <laughs> oh, this is a beautiful church. Wow. Oh, what a beautiful atmosphere, beautiful everything. Praise the Lord. Apostle George, I just reported you how you 
gave me so much water yesterday and I had to be taking those. Um... He bought six more. I refuse to yield to temptation today in Jesus' name. I refuse. Me, Wale, no temptation today. Uh, in Jesus' name. How is everybody doing? Eh? Y'all looking hot. You have a photograph. You, 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 photographs, eh? You, people cannot be looking this hot and they don't take photographs. I told them a story yesterday. I'll, tell, I'll start with that story today. I was working for the Supreme Court. So um, I had missed the flight out of Malin, Malin. Mm -hmm. So they now had to get me to Mombasa to get the next flight. And the only car available was the official car of the Chief Justice of Kenya. It was a couple of years ago. So I'm sitting in that car. You know those ones you say, say surely the Lord is in this place. <laughs> I'm sitting in that car. There as we are, as we are leaving, I'm thinking, ah, somebody has to see me. How can I be in this car? Eh? And nobody sees me. So as we're getting close to Kilifi, we have a church in Kilifi. I called the bishop. I said, where are you? Are you in there? He said, yes. I said, okay, I'm coming. So when we got there, he goes, no, but we had to, somebody had to see me. <laughs> so we drove in. We opened the gate, we drove in. The bishop was, everybody saw this big car coming on the hook. So I came out. Say, hey, what's up? It's me. Say, okay, bye. I have to go to the airport. I said all that to say, people cannot be looking this hot. I and mean, we are not seeing. We have to take photographs up to roll today. Are you ready? Amen. Glory to God. Hey, today we are going to enter some dynamical. Are you ready? <laughs> The guys, we had a great time yesterday, didn't we? Well, we had a great time. In fact, I went home and I was sleeping and I was dreaming of guys. That's when you know it's bad. <laughs> That's when you know things are very, very bad. You know, <laughs> All right. Father, you speak to us this morning the entrance of your word brings light and understanding to the simple thank you because the word we need to take us to where we ought to be let it come this morning in jesus name genesis chapter 5 verse 25 i'm going to give you a lot of scriptures uh, a lot of scriptures. Genesis chapter 5, 25. We start from 25 to 29. And if you're looking for a title or topic for what I'm going to be talking about, it's the last man standing. Amen. Last man standing. That when everybody is saying there is a casting down i shall be the last one standing and i will be saying there is a lifting even if i'm the only one a thousand will fall at my side ten thousand at my right hand i am going to be the last man standing they say oh the organization is downsizing and all that if there is going to be only one person left the CEO, even the CEO will resign and I will be the last man standing. So let's look at somebody in the Bible who was actually the last man standing. <laughs> and let's see how he did it. So it's the story of Noah. But let's look. Methuselah lived 187 years and begot Lamech. Let's go on. After he begot Lamech, Methuselah lived 700... These guys were living, man. Now, can I tell you something? You want to hear? You know why God got angry with Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist? Because he had seen all... He, he knew about all this. Guys were giving birth at the age of 300. You know, 
<clears throat> and you, you are 70 and you are complaining. that Are you hearing me today? Okay, let me go on. Thank you so much. Is this for water? Okay, since you have bought it, you can bring it now. <laughs> so your labor is not in vain. Hmm? Thank you. Are you laughing at me? You are laughing with me. Hmm. Ah. So listen. Methuselah lived 782 years and had sons and daughters. Let's go on. So all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. Let's go on. And Lamech lived 182 years and he begat a son and called his name Noah. So you have historical background for Noah. Now, based on this, Methuselah was 187 years when he gave birth to a father Lamech, who later became the father of Noah. That's simple, yeah? So, Noah lived 600 years while Methuselah was alive. Okay? So, He's learning from his grandfather. Methuselah is Noah's grandfather. That's very important information. You understand what I'm saying? He's learning from his grandfather. Can you imagine the stories he would have learned? He would have heard. I've been hearing, you know, amazing stories of his great grandfather. You know who his great grandfather was? Enoch. Enoch walked with God and he was taken. Can you imagine these are these stories going on between grandfather and grandson? Now, Methuselah, Methuselah's name means, very important, when he dies, it shall be sent. That's the literal meaning of the word Methuselah. When he dies, it shall be sent. So, Methuselah was a warning to humanity. In his mercy, God kept that guy going for 969 years, warning of the flood. And his very name is, when he dies, it shall be sent. Now, still looking at the background, do you know when Noah's father was born? I'm just painting the background of, you know, for Noah. When Noah's father was born, do you know? Adam was still alive. Because Adam lived 900 and something. You, you understand what I'm saying? So you don't want to imagine the stories Noah grew up hearing. That what was Adam like? Ah, the guy was cool, you know? But, but Eve, eh, she was hot. Almost as hot as Apostle Angie. You know? <laughs> this guy's Saw these guys. You understand what I'm saying? That's the environment in which Noah was raised. So they are getting firsthand information. What was it like before the fall? And Noah, I mean, Adam, I'm sure, when talking to his grandchildren, will probably tear up that, oh man, before the fall, it was something, it was this. All right? So using Noah's life as a case study, we are now going to look at what it takes to be the last man standing. 
Because Noah was what? The last man stand. Are you ready? So the first, and we're going to look at the first attribute was be schooled by the word. If you want to be the last person standing, be schooled by the word. You know, the word then was not a written form, but encounters and communication with God were passed from one generation to the other through storytelling, all right? Today, we have the written word with us. And Jesus said something very, very profound. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 34 to 40. Matthew 22, 34 to 40. It says, when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. One of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Let's read the last part together. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So how are we keeping the commandment of God today? Is the commandment of love. Is somebody hearing me? Romans chapter 13, verse 8 to 10. O no man, nothing but to love one another. For he that loveth has fulfilled the law. Wow. He that loveth has fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. If there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, Love is the fulfilling of the law. So, Galatians chapter 5, verse 14, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. 1 Corinthians 13, 13, and now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is love is seeing people as they can be and not as they are. Somebody hear me today. Love is being the hand of God to nations. Love is extending the kindness of God to humanity without expecting anything back. I was invited to speak at the World CSR Conference a couple of years ago. And I said, for CSR, we need to move from CSR to what I call PSR, Personal Social Responsibility. That I'm not doing it for a photo op. I'm not gonna give you 1 million and then spend 5 million to tell the world that I gave you 1 million. Somebody hearing me? Love is the fulfillment of the law that I am seeing people the way God sees them, not the way they are. I am loving unconditionally. I am opening my heart. Now, let me tell you the part of love that you want to, you, you listen. And this is where a lot of us close up. Love is opening yourself, listen, to be hurt. So he said, um, how many times shall a person offend you in a day? He said, 70. Wow. In a day. 490 times. 
Now, some of us, I'm talking for myself. You guys are more spiritual than me. You do it the first time. <laughs> Second time, it's a warning. Third time, I still believe in the five-fold ministry. <laughs> Is somebody hearing me? And I even have scriptures for it. Those are the scriptures I use for killing mosquitoes. He, del <laughs> he delivers my enemy into my hands. <laughs> when you live in Lagos, you better have scripture for mosquitoes. Delivers my enemies into my hand. Hey. <laughs> but love says, you know what? You have the potential to hurt me. But you know what? The love of God is shed abroad in my heart. I also have the potential to forgive you. Because it would take love for Noah to be preaching to everybody who hated him, hated what he was doing, despised him. What propelled him to keep preaching to them? The Bible calls him a preacher of righteousness. It was love. Why? He was schooled by the word. The people closest to the Garden of Eden were teaching him. And saying, you know what? That garden, it was a love, love atmosphere. It was love. That means it was not possible to think ill of someone. It was not possible to hold a grudge. I listened to Kenneth Hagen, and he said the only time he ever got a headache was when he had either drifted out of the will of God, or he said once when he had an argument with his granddaughter. And he said he had the worst headache. When she came back, he said, forgive me, forgive me. Because love keeps sickness away. Are you hearing me today? It keeps sickness away. And you know, unfortunately, you know one of the things missing in a lot of church today is love. Jesus, the high priest, can be touched. He can be touched. But the low priests cannot be touched. Eh? Is somebody hearing me today? I want you to say something to the person next to you. Say, we are part of the same body. The body of Christ. And so I love you as, with the love of God. And because I love you, I am here for you. I am available for you. I've got your back. If you need me, I'll be there. And I know if you need me, no, if I need you, you'll be there. I love you and I'm here for you. You may now kiss the bride. <laughs> hey, whoa. So, be schooled by the word. Be schooled by the word. Let me tell you something. I, I tell everybody who cares to listen. I don't have an opinion on anything. My opinion is the word. And that's okay. The Bible says this, but this is what I think. Am I mad? I line up my thinking to what the word says. And as such, I need to make the time to get the word in me. Because that's the only thing that will keep me. Are you hearing me today? Good. Then the next thing I saw about Noah that made him the last man standing, you must be ready to stand alone. Mm. 
Genesis chapter five, chapter six, from verse five, and we'll go all the way to verse nine. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Can you believe that? Genesis chapter 6, we're on verse 7 now. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air for it repented me that i have made them but noah found grace in the eyes of the lord noah was a just man and perfect in his generations and noah walked with god now did the flood destroy just the city did it destroy just the country? What did it destroy? The entire world. So that means Noah was a lone voice in the entire world. How do you hold on to something and you are the only person in the whole world that believes it? That is the tenacity that Noah had. That you are the only person that believes it. You know, the Bible says, he yeah, has not heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. But you know, the minute God begins to give you, you we're praying, God give us those ideas. You know how we mess it up? The minute God gives us those ideas, we go and look for, ah, who else has done this? Who else has done this? And then you now talk to some mumu who has never done anything in his life. A lion does not care about the opinion of the antelope. Lion, go and meet antelope. What do you think? Should I kill you? <laughs> Is somebody hearing me today? That's why we miss it. We are scared to stand alone. How many of you can confess that there have been ideas that God gave you? And nobody has, you've not had it from anybody, so you just discarded it. <laughs> Is somebody hearing me? When God gave me the idea of launching a program called the Street University, nobody understood what I was talking about. They didn't, even me, I didn't understand. <laughs> but you know what? I was pursuing this. I was pursuing it. Now, we're in a place where People are beginning to see it. And some Japanese investors were speaking to them. They want to pour in some big cash into it and all that. But let me tell you, if everybody understood it when it came, then it's not unique. If everybody understood it, then anybody can get it. There is a difference between a stone out there and a precious gem. It's rarity, isn't it? So, you have to be willing to stand alone. When God called me and said, go to Kenya, nobody understood though. My late dad, mighty man of, uh, of books, the mighty man of God later, but mighty man of book, professor of medicine. So who have you, where, where are you going to stay when you get there? I don't know. How are you going to go? I honestly don't know. Who are you going to work with when you get there? I don't know. Are you starting a church? Are you working with a church? Whatever? I, say, I don't know. Who is going to work with you when you get there? I don't know. Then he got angry. What do you know? That God called me. Then he said, and who have you seen? that has done such a foolish thing before. That's the place I should have kept quiet, eh? But you know me, I like trouble. I said, Abraham, he said, get out. Just go. <laughs> get out. And don't come back until you have your act together. I said, okay. And I didn't go back until the day I was leaving. Then, he now called my wife. 
So you people are really, really living. I think I was talking to him. I had attitude, man. What are you talking about? I didn't have time for him. So I was talking to Taiwo. So all the information, because he had told me to get out. He didn't have the confidence to ask me for, for what going. You know what I mean? He's talking to Taiwo. Oh, when I was going, he's crying. I was so happy. Then my mom, she called me. My mom said, kneel down. So I knelt down. She laid hands. She began to prophesy. That God is taking you into that land like a Joseph. You are going to have influence. You are going to have. Is somebody hearing me? How many people are ready to stand alone? Eh? Because the truth is this. The idea that's going to turn your life around will not be understood by the masses. If you are looking for something that the masses will understand, then it's going to be kawaida. Somebody hear me today? The idea that will turn your life around, I has not seen, ear has not heard. People are not going to, and then to you, it's going to look so simple. It's going to look so simple. And this is why you have to develop your confidence in your ability to flow with God. Are you hearing me today? You've got to develop your confidence in that. So Noah was a lone voice in the whole world, not just in a city. Now, and you get upset when people in your department don't understand you. You get upset when people in your family don't understand you. This brother, man, nobody in the world understood him. The spectacular nature of vision is in its uniqueness. If everybody can see it and understand it, it will no more be spectacular and unique. Is somebody hearing me today? A time comes when if you don't believe in yourself, you cannot go forward. Because for most great visions, if everyone could see it, they would have done it. How many of you have ever been in a place where you say, hey, somebody ought to have done this. It's so simple. Somebody, how many of you have heard? You are that somebody. Oh. You are that somebody. <laughs> I, you know, I'm a musician. And um, I just love music. I have in my study, I have a big piano there. And then I have a keyboard by my by the side of my table, of my desk. So if I'm working and my head, I need to, I just turn around. Play a bit, worship God, and then come back to work. You know? And I felt somebody needs to create an umbrella for young musicians who are so creative, but nobody is opening doors for them, creating platforms for them. And I said this so much. And I was looking for that somebody ought to do this. So one day, I had two of my friends, a saxophonist and a guitarist. This guitarist has played for David Doe, played for, name it. So he came in from Lagos. So just the same thing I felt about this Chief Justice car. Eh? So I said, how can these kind of musicians be in my house and nobody will hear them and nobody will see them? So, I live in a very small part of Kilifi called the Plantation. Just a few homes there. God lives there. He visits Nairobi from time to time. So, <laughs> and we are front row on the cliff ocean. Um, yeah, I see dolphins from time to time. Uh, for my... <laughs> my bedroom. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah. 
So I decided, let me call, there's an international school there. So I called the proprietress, the owner of the international school, I said, come for, let's have a drink this evening. I want you to come and meet my friends. So she came. And as guys were jamming, you know, just the guitarist and the saxophonist said, what? But as we, I said, don't you think our neighbors should see this? She said, yeah, Wale. I said, let's do it again tomorrow. She said, yes. And the following day, we had a packed out attendance. And we began a monthly jazz session. But then news went out that something good is happening here. So musicians began to reach out to me from Diani, from Malindi, musicians who come in from Nairobi, people who come in from Nairobi, it became, it's become a big event. And now we, not, we have some artists under management. Somebody ought to do it. Who is the somebody? What's that song? Is it Man in the Mirror? You are the one. You are the one who needs to do it. Is somebody hearing me today? So, my plan for them is good. It's simple. I have built a vast network in the corporate world over the years. So, I'm just knocking on the doors of companies and say, hey, I have somebody who can sing for you. I have somebody who can blow your brand out, fund an album. My artists get money. And they're ambassadors, just the same way Whiskey is a, an ambassador for UBA. Some of you are judging me that I know who Whiskey is. I even know David Do. Eh? I am unavailable. <laughs> unavailable. <laughs> You don't know that song? Ah, I've also, you are becoming too holy. <laughs> How many of you know unavailable? Look at, look at your flock, look at your flock, look at your flock. <laughs> so who is that person that needs to do it? When you think somebody needs to do something about this. Are you hearing me today? You know, you need to be ready to stand alone. Ezekiel 22, 30, he says, I sought for a man, not for a committee. <laughs> I sought for a man. Eh? Isaiah 59, 16, he said, he saw there was no man. No man. Eh? Isaiah 51, verse 2. Look unto Abraham your father and unto Sarah that bear you. Listen, for I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. Then one of my favorite verses in the Bible, Acts chapter 22, verse 7. This is Paul narrating what happened on the road to Damascus. I fell onto the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And they, were, they that were with me, saw, listen, they saw the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spoke. He was the only one that heard what God said to him. And you know what? He believed it and dared to stand alone. Nobody else. One day, I had written one book. It was a uh, mental independence. And I was talking about the ability to think without precedence. You understand what I'm saying? You know, and this is what I'm talking about right now also. So, I have, no, it's okay now. I, I dreamt that I sold half a million copies. So I woke up at about 2 a.m. That dream, I was so excited. 
So I tapped Taiwo. Taiwo, 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 Taiwo. I woke up. She said, what? I said, I just had a dream that we sold half a million copies of this book. Do you know what she said? She said, okay. I went back to sleep. I was so angry. How can you just say, okay? Isn't that the place where she just said, oh, wow. Amazing. Praise God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then God consoled me. You know, God, God, God sometimes has to console you from your wife. You understand what I'm saying? God consoled me. He said, you know, no matter how close you are, even though you're on the same bed, she could never independently verify that dream. No dream has a witness. Are you hearing me today? No dream has a witness. But great dreams are fulfilled when you are able to have mental independence. Run with it and say, you know what? I would rather try and fail than succeed at nothing. It's better to fail at something than to succeed at nothing. Paul said, they saw the light, but they did not hear the voice. I'm the only one who heard the voice. The ability to stand alone is crucial. And let me tell you what I found out. When you stand alone, it's just a matter of time. The people that despised it and said it won't work and gossiped about you will be the ones sharing your testimonies. And then next thing they'll say, oh, I start, when Wale was starting, I was there. I was there. It's a lie. You know, one day, let me tell you one day, I got into the flesh. But sometimes, you know, the flesh is very sweet, you know. Okay, Apostle, you are good. Okay, I mean, I got into the flesh. It was a TV show, a breakfast show, and people were calling in. And this person, you know those people that they do you so bad that the only prayer you can think of praying for them is, ah, God bless you. You see, what you have done in my life, may God repay you a thousand times. And then they don't say amen. <laughs> they don't say amen. So, this person now calls and begin, begins to say, oh, my papa, we started, I knew when he started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And begins to uh, on you know, TV, I mentioned her name, I like somebody I knew. But there's a scripture for everything. I found the scripture for you too, right there. So I think he was, I can't remember who he was, said, Ah, oh, Dr. Wale. Yeah, I said, Ah, I don't know how. Oh, I felt so good. I felt so good. But that's what Jesus did. He said, When did we say, Depart from me? I knew you not. So I'm acting on the word of apostles. <laughs> Depart from me. I knew, if you didn't see me when I was invisible, you don't deserve my attention now that I'm visible. Some of you will get that day after tomorrow. Is somebody hearing me today? They will come. They will tell you that without them, you would not be here. They will tell you that is what happens when you dare to stand alone? How many people are going to stand alone now? Eh? I see a lot of people. When I started doing many years ago, I was having a program once a month called Coffee with Dr. Wale. Oh, and people thought, mm, people said, who is going to pay money to come and listen to you? Who's, who's your mama? <laughs> <laughs> you know, let me tell you, success is the sweetest form of revenge. Hmm? Then who's going to pay money? Because, and these were 
very well learned people. Well, we started. <laughs> Next thing, everybody there's, I'm doing coffee, then there's chai with so and so, something with so and so. Everybody wanted a piece of the action. But by that time, you know what? I said, keep it, baby. I'm on to something else. Woo! Are you hearing me today? You dare to stand alone. Then you become a pioneer. And then you can set how things operate. They told me, nobody will ever pay you more than $500 in a day in Kenya. That's what I was told, though, by experts. Hey! So, okay. Then one day, and that's uh, just kept it under $500, you know. Then one day, I was working for Crown Paints. This was many years ago. CEO. So we, they took me to Momasa, and I decided, let me just push the envelope a bit. So I asked them for about equivalent of $600 then. When I finished, full day, when I finished, the CEO, Mr. Rao, Rakesh, he called, he called me at the end of the day. He said, I didn't know you were going to be good. I said, why? He said, you charged us so little. <laughs> That's when I realized, who have you been talking to? You're talking to all those, your friends. You're always complaining about the price of petrol, the price of the... My friend. Ah. So my next job, my next job, guess what? I pushed it up, baby. <laughs> First, I did another 600. I was convinced that it was not a fluke. They paid, then I moved to $1,000. They paid for a day. I moved to 1,500, they paid. Eh? Then I moved to equivalent of 200 and, 250,000 Kenyan shillings a day, and they paid. By that time, I said, now you know what? I'm international, baby. I'm going to be charging in US dollars. I began to charge per hour. Hey! And then guess what? What did they do? They paid. Now, that $500 that they said nobody will pay you $500 a day. I said $500 per hour. They paid. Then I moved to $700 per hour. They paid. $1,000 per hour. They paid. $1,500 per hour. They paid. Let me stop there so I don't offend you. <laughs> and they are still paying are you hearing me then one day I said God you know we can move this thing to another level I said let's do $10,000 a day and they paid you know it was when my fees was now flying high like that that's when the big boys now came that's when Google will knock on your door that's when Oracle will knock on your door that's when the big boys come and that's when i decided that eh, my calling is not to work listen i will work for only people that can afford to pay me any other person is classified as charity i'm not going to work for people that are going to be negotiating oh please let's pay the i told them i said when you want to buy a car you can buy a brand new rolls royce and you can buy a third hand volkswagen b2 i said in the industry i'm the rolls royce baby and when you are standing beside the Rolls Royce, the question you don't ask, eh, is it efficient with fuel or more? You are looking at the wrong car. <laughs> looking at the wrong car. If you get intimidated by your value, you will never attract what you are worth. I feel like playing this keyboard. Is it on? If you are intimidated by your value, you will never be paid what you are worth. Never. Paul the Apostle said, I magnify my office. And this is how I have worked in 22 African countries. Zambia wanted me to come, as a, a, a bank in Zambia wanted me to come. And they said, you are six times more expensive than the last person I had. That's your own problem. It's not my problem. And they still call me. It's not my problem. <laughs> so we're looking at about $3 million in investment. And I'm telling the people, I say, uh, for, for Street University, I'm not desperate. I said, you see, let me explain. 
if I'm going from here to Mombasa and I'm going in that Toyota that cannot go beyond, and maybe I'm rough at 80 kilometers per hour, you know, but it is still going. I said, and if I continue, I will get to Mombasa. I said, so whether you like it or not, Street University is on its way to becoming the a Kenyan unicorn. A unicorn is a company with a billion dollar valuation. I said, we're on the way to becoming that. Are you hearing me today? I said, so we are going at 80 kilometers per hour. I said, what you will do with your $3 million is you have simply brought another car that can go faster and it will get us there faster. What we? Or without your car, um, uh, I'm going, <laughs> we're gone. You know what that does? I'm not desperate. I'm not desperate. Because I know I'm already on the track. If you are not willing to stand alone, your success will be limited to what everybody else. If you are ready to stand alone, then you enter into deep waters. You know, I read the Blue Ocean Strategy and it really impacted me. And I applied it for my life. I said, I love swimming. I swim every single day. And uh, I just thought you should know, my pool is the biggest private pool you have ever seen in your life. And this is not bragging, it is giving glory where it is due. So I swim every day <laughs> in my house, not in the club, not in the. <laughs> so listen, but I would, you know, years ago, I would leave, go to Mombasa and I'll take a boat, go out. I learned how to swim in the ocean. My wife once said, maybe I have mommy water spirit. Anyway. <laughs> So I would go out into the deep where there is nobody else swimming. It is so quiet. The only sound is water lapping against my body or against the boat. Wow. I get out, I swim. I feel like Superman. I'm in control. Now, where are the noisemakers? They are at the beach, oh, they can't swim. So the listen, and because they cannot swim, that means, listen, <laughs> the communication at the, the language of the beach is competition. The language in the deep is collaboration. Are you hearing me? So I don't want to be by the beach. If I'm swimming and I'm hearing this noise of competition, nya, 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 it means I need to swim further out. Swim further out. You are alone out there. Then if I'm going to meet anybody else out there, you know who is going to be? A deep swimmer like myself. And then we can talk on the same level. Are you hearing me today? We can talk on the same level. So did you get that? All right, let's, let's wrap this up. Now, number three thing, for those who are going to be the last man standing, you have to be a person of faith. A person of faith. Hebrews eleven seven. by faith, Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. And I'm going to run through this because this is a faith house anyway. But you know, the Bible says, 1 John 5, 4, that this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So it is faith that overcomes the world. Faith overcomes the world. How does faith come? Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if the devil wants to cut off your faith supply, what does he do? He cuts off your word supply. Because as long as you are hearing the word, faith will rise. And that's why 
you need to develop mechanisms for hearing the word. Let me tell you, when I'm sleeping, the word is playing. When I'm in the bathroom, the word is playing. Every time I must be hearing something that is boosting my faith. And you know what he's doing? I must be hearing things that are painting pictures in my mind. Are you hearing me today? So, and then another thing, your words is, we have in the same spirit of faith, we believe, therefore we speak. So faith speaks. Faith does not speak what it is going through. Faith speaks where it is going to. It's not speaking well, what it is going through. Oh, things are better. No, 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 no. We are on our way to becoming a unicorn. Billion dollar company in this Kenya. And our, our, our arriving there is not a function of the economy. We are operating a kingdom economy and we superimpose the kingdom upon the Kenyan economy. The Kenyan economy will learn from the Shandaya. Is somebody hearing me today? You know, when you are super confident in your God, insecure and ignorant people will call you arrogant. Are you hearing me today? So faith, you're going to keep speaking that thing. Okay? And that's why Hebrews captures that Noah was a man of faith. Now, the last one, and this one, I deliberately, I, I, I think it's so crucial. Noah, he took two of, and he, he must be a covenant practitioner. A covenant practitioner. I mean, the word says, beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health. So that's, that's his will. That's his will. And you know, sometimes, you know, in the African setting, when the people contest the will and all that, but what happened to Jesus? I mean, he died so the will could come into effect. And then he rose to watch over it, to perform it. So nobody can mess around with it. All right? So we have all that. All that is written. We all know that. All right? But when you look at Noah, and this is what fascinates me about him. Do you know he was starting from ground zero? Let me put it this way. There was nobody else on earth. It was just Noah and his family. There was nobody else. How many of you have ever been in a situation that bad before? That you are the only one on earth? So Noah, if we can know how Noah got out of that situation and we know what he did, then we can apply it. Wow. So Noah comes out. He's the only person on earth. And then God gives him the same command he gave Adam. Genesis chapter 9. Verse 1, and God blessed Noah and his sons and said, be fruitful, multiply. Isn't that what he told Adam? Multiply, replenish. You know, so the, cover, the commandment God gave Noah was similar to the one he gave Adam. He was starting with a world that had been totally destroyed and he was expected to make it fruitful. How was he going to do this? It means the world we see today can literally be traced back to, to, to the flood. So how was Noah going to make this happen? Let's see the first thing Noah did immediately after the flood. Uh, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 8, and we're going to read from verse 14. It says, in the second month, on the seventh and twentieth day of the month, was the earth dried. God spoke to Noah, saying, go forth of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your son's wives with you. Bring forth with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, both fowl. And God tells him to bring all these things out. And he did verse 20. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord 
and took of every clean beast of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled the sweet savour, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. Then God now institutes something. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. So he built an altar and offered burnt offerings. He took two of he took you know, two of each animal. Now, let me ask, where did he get the animals from? Because remember, we are told he took two of each animal onto the ark. If he was now sacrificing them, then, so listen to what happened, Genesis chapter seven. Woo! Remember what I said? We have no opinion. The word answers its own questions. Any question posed in the word, the answer must be in the word. So where did Noah get the animals he sacrificed from? Genesis chapter 7, verse 2 to 3. Take with you seven pairs of every kind of clean animal, a male and its mate, and one pair of every kind of unclean animal, a male and its mate and also seven pairs of every kind of bird male and female to keep their various kinds alive throughout the earth before the flood god had made a provision for what he will sacrifice on the altar so what is the new testament parallel for that second corinthians chapter 9 verse 10 now he that ministers seed to the sower both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Before the need arrives, God gives you the seed. God gave Noah the seed he will sow immediately after the flood. Noah found himself in a world with nothing. All he had was a covenant and a seed. And with that, he was able to fulfill the commandment to be fruitful. God never leaves you without a seed. With, a, with the covenant and a seed, it doesn't matter how deep and how far gone you are. This is what helped Noah to rebuild the earth. When I was in the deepest of all pits, I shared with the men yesterday, when I was in the deep pit, this was what helped me to climb out. A covenant and a seed. Look, when you find yourself in debt that runs into hundreds of millions. Are you hearing me? That is... There's nobody you can talk to and say, okay, please, can you help me? Give me 100 million. You understand? You better know how God's principles work. The covenant and the seed. What the covenant is there. It's waiting for everybody. But the covenant is activated by the seed. This is how I got out. The widow of Zarephath, 1 Kings 17. God told Elijah, he says, I have commanded the widow to look after you. Elijah got to the widow. She has not had the commandment. Though. Because if she had had the commandment, she would have said, ah, you are the one God told me about. She said that she's going to eat what she has with her son and die. Does that sound like somebody who has had a commandment? Are you hearing me? But can God lie? So if God says, I have commanded her, and she, can, she has not heard, what's, what's going on? Are you hearing me? And this... God, 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 God. This is 
where God sends the prophetic into your life. She had not had anything, but there was a commandment on her life to do exactly what God had said. You've not had anything, but some of you, there's a commandment on your life to feed nations. Then, so Elijah was sent to her to help her activate the commandment on her life. So Elijah says, okay, you want to eat and die? Go and do as you have said. But before you die, feed me. And the minute she did that, guess what happened? Did she fulfill the commandment? I want to tell you guys today, there's a commandment on your life. There, I, you know, I knew there was a commandment on my life. I, 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 look, as a kid, I knew there was a commandment on my life. I will have dreams, I will have visions. And I knew that that commandment on my life was a commandment that was going to take me to a great place where I will, I will be a voice to leaders. I, I knew the commandment on my life was going to take me to a place of wealth that nobody could explain logically. Is somebody hearing me? When my daughter was a, small, a little girl, baby, and I, you know, little girl, I asked her one day, just joking, what do you want to be when you grow up? She said, a billionaire. I knew this is Wally's daughter. Amen. And she's on the way now. She was working somewhere. She said she didn't like the fact that she could not see her nephew, you know, my grandson. She said she didn't like that. So she told them, she said, you know, because they told her she had to come to work every day. She said, I don't like, I, I want to work from home. So she said, please, I have a nephew. I, I, I can't see him. So I want to leave this job. They said, you can work from anywhere you want and we'll double your salary. Then while that is going on, a British company reaches out to her and wants her to work. She told them the same story. I have a nephew. I need to be able to see my nephew. When I said, no problem. You can work from wherever you want. And they paid her double the double of the other place. Then there's a Korean company, beauty company that she represents. She does stuff for them. They are paying her. The girl is on her way to becoming what she said. But I asked her, so how do you do it? She's, she's very young. How do you do it? She said, I never mess around with my tithing and my, and my giving. The covenant is waiting for whosoever. You know, and let me tell you something. Never get involved in all this rubbish talk of tithe and no tithe and yeah, 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 yeah. Never get involved with those kind of things. Are you hearing me today? <laughs> you know, Paul was writing Hebrews chapter 7. Look for that verse in Hebrews chapter 7. It says, those that are on earth receive tithes. He said, we that are on, the people that are on earth receive tithes. That is Hebrews Old Testament. So Paul is writing to Hebrew. That people that are on tithe, on, on, on earth, receive tithe. Are you hearing me? Eh? Here, mortal man receives tithe. This is Hebrews. And Paul, whoever wrote Hebrews, said, here, here, on earth. Mortal man receives tithe. Then some mumu is saying, eh, Old Testament, New Testament, yeah, 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 yeah. Yet, when you want to pray for security, um, a thousand shall fall at my side, 10,000, you don't say that's Old Testament scripture at that point. You don't say it's Old Testament at that point. Why are you selective? Eh? He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow, my friend, Old Testament. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Every tongue that rises up against me in judgment is Isaiah 54. Is Isaiah in the New Testament? 
So why are you picking? Are you hearing me? The covenant and the seed. God, if you are able to put this in place, the Lord said, no matter what is happening around you, you will be the last man standing. Are you hearing me today? Oh, let's stand up and thank him. Let's stand up and thank him. Glory to God. Let's stand up and thank him. Let's stand up and thank him. Thank him, thank him, thank him, thank him. Glory to God. Oh, lift your voice and begin to bless him. Thank him because you will be the last man standing. Oh, hallelujah. You will be the last man standing. Oh, hallelujah.